I was giving a public talk and um, man stood up and said, how do, I, how do I not feel guilt about the way I pass my trauma onto my kids? Which incidentally we all do until we figure it out. And I asked him, when in your life have you not felt guilty? He said, never. In other words, the guilt predated anything he ever did. And the guilt actually began, when you analyze it, because his parents were not happy and he thought that was his fault when he was two years old. You know, so at that point you decide I'm just not worthy. And then you do anything wrong that feeds that sense of unworthiness. But what you did wrong didn't cause the unworthiness. The unworthiness came first. Otherwise, they would just be held to remorse. Hello, hello, and welcome to the Meta Hour podcast with Sharon Salzberg. I'm Lily Cushman. I produce this podcast. And we're here today with episode 217 with another segment of our real life series. Today's interview is Sharon speaking with Dr. Gabor Mate. And this was originally recorded in the Living an Authentic Life Summit, which happened early in 2023 as part of the release of Sharon's new book, Real Life which also happens to be the subject of this series. So this interview was part of the second day of the summit, which was exploring the theme of contraction, constriction, and isolation. You may know Gabor's work already. He has been on the Meta Hour once before as part of the release of his most recent book, The Myth of Normal. Today's conversation is a sprawling one that looks at a lot of the different aspects of the ways contraction can affect us, initially on a psychological level and also on physiological levels. There's talk about a whole bunch of different things, the vagus nerve, shame, compassionate inquiry, grief, working with grief, moral injury, and Gabor's dry but hilarious admittance that he's not a regular meditator. (laughs) They also talk about vicarious trauma, caregivers, and compassion fatigue. So this is a super interesting conversation. And before we dive in, I want to let you know that Sharon is doing some teaching in the month of July as part of the Insight Meditation Society's online teaching program. And she's doing a series of three classes that are part of this larger nine-month program called Essential Mindfulness. And Sharon is diving into mindfulness and equanimity. She'll be teaching three dates, July 13, 20, and 27. And you can go to our website at SharonSalzberg.com. You can get all the details to join us. So let's get to today's episode, Sharon Salzberg and Dr. Gabor Mate. Welcome back to the summit. I'm Sharon Salzberg, and I'm so glad to be here with Dr. Gabor Mate, who will explore today's theme of contraction with me and movement into expansion and freedom. Much of his work is centered upon this theme, and he spent his career helping his patients become unstuck from these places of contraction and move into greater connection and wholeness. Gabor is a retired physician who, after 20 years of family practice and palliative care experience, worked for over a decade in Vancouver's downtown east side with patients challenged by drug addiction and mental illness. The best-selling author of five books, published in 30 languages, including the award-winning In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts, Close Encounters with Addiction. Gabor is an internationally renowned speaker, highly sought after for his expertise on addiction, trauma, childhood development, and the relationship of stress and illness. For his groundbreaking medical work and writing, he's been awarded the Order of Canada, 
his country's highest civilian distinction, and the Civic Merit Award from his hometown, Vancouver. His fifth book, The Myth of Normal, Trauma, Illness, and Healing in a Toxic Culture, was released on September 13th, 2022. Welcome. It's really great to be able to speak with you again. And uh, really, I have been so happy uh, just feeling the uh, growing extent of, of the impact of your work and, and people listening in a different way because we certainly seem to live in toxic cultures, many of us. And and here we are um, moving toward, toward healing. So uh, I'm curious if you could say what led you to medicine and especially that kind of holistic approach. Well, um, first of all, thanks for asking. And, and uh, certainly the theme of your new book, which is the um, movement from contraction to expansion, from narrowness to, to spaciousness, um, is a much deeper theme in medicine than most people realize. Because what I found is that most chronic illnesses of mind and body really has to do with the contraction. Uh, both on the psychological and the, and, and the physiological levels. And um, as to what led me to that work, um, well, I think as you, you probably know this from your own life, our motives are always mixed, and they're always a mixture of our conscious intentions and then our hidden drives. So I'd have to say on the conscious level, uh, my decision to go into medicine was a desire to do interesting work, a desire to help humanity, to help heal humanity, um, a desire to find a meaningful existence, also a desire for financial security and social status, you know. Um, on the unconscious level, I think there were two other factors. One is that my grandfather, who has died in Auschwitz, happened to have been a physician and a writer. And what a surprise, I became a physician and a writer. And I think to some extent, I was probably trying to feel the hole in my mother's heart left by the death of her beloved father. Um, and there was another um, dynamic as well, which is based on my own infant trauma, my belief, my core belief, my hidden belief that I wasn't worthwhile, wasn't acceptable, wasn't important. Well, if you're not worthwhile, not important, not wanted, go to medical school. They're going to want you all the time. You get a chance mm -hmm. to, you're going to get a chance to prove every day just how important you are. So I, I really do think it was a mixture of those factors. And the positive ones, the, the ones just desired to serve and to do meaningful work, are not obviated by the unconscious ones. But to the extent that the unconscious ones were driving me, they were actually interfering with the best embodiment of the positive motivations. So it's, it's, it's always an interesting mixture of the dark and the light, isn't it? I think it really is. And, and uh, it's interesting too, I think, to watch one's mode of change yeah. and, and deepen. I think for myself, I became interested in meditation purely for personal reasons about my own personal suffering. And I could have been in any number of rituals, countless rituals, yeah. talking about the suffering of others and, uh, working with others. And it's like, I didn't care, you know, I really couldn't until I grew, you know, to a certain extent. And then, and then suddenly it was so achingly obvious to me that coming to terms with my own pain meant finding other people, yeah. other beings, because we find one another in those spaces. Which leads me to ask a question about the title of your book, because it's called real life. Now yeah. that assumed that there's an unreal life. Otherwise yeah. you just would have called it life. And uh, right. <laughs> which is what Keith Richards called his autobiography, by the way, it was called, it's called Life. Um, so when you say real life, what are you implying about the possibility of an unreal life? And, and, and what's the difference between the two? Because one of the themes in my work is that just that need to be authentic. So I understood what yeah. you have to say. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I sort of got on the real train, not of my own volition, like, uh, Many years ago, I read a book called Real Happiness, and the original title was something like Why Meditate? And then I got an advanced copy of a friend, Matthew Ricard's book, which is going to be called Why Meditate? And so we mm. quickly had to scramble and, and find a different title. And so the publisher came up with Real Happiness, and um, I was a little ambivalent. I thought 
maybe it's what we actually want most deeply is is not something kind of shiny and transitory, mm-hmm. but something we can actually dwell in, you know, in good times and in hard times. And um, but I had a feeling I'd get in trouble for it, and sure enough, I did more for the word happiness than anything. And uh, mm-hmm. later, I I, um, I was being interviewed by a, a friend for a podcast, and and they asked me what I did when I meditated. And apparently I said, I sit down and I get real, Hmm. which they quote all the time back to me. And, and because I liked that answer, uh, even though it was inadvertent, it just came out of my mouth. I thought, wow, that's, that's important for us all. It was important for me. It's important for all of us, just as you say, to have a sense of authenticity and, and, uh, so as I was on the real train, then there was real happiness at work and real love and real change. And yeah. uh, so this book, they kind of wanted a real something in the title. And I was down to real life, you know, it was like the biggest category I could come to. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I just um, read the the, bag- the memoir of Prince Harry called Spare. Yeah. And um, in fact, I'll be speaking to him later this week. We're doing a live stream together. And... Uh, that book, and I'm only bringing it in because it's so relevant, is actually about reality. It's about a person trying to become real mm-hmm. in, in the face of the pressures of tradition and pomp and circumstance and family dysfunction. Who are they really? And I just think that's so universal. And I think that's our struggle is to who are we really? You know, I, a friend of mine leads in and something called an enlightenment intensive. And the question that people pose to each other that ultimately sometimes just breaks, breaks open the doors of perception is, tell me who you are. And the fact is, most of us haven't got a clue who we are. Mm-hmm. So I think that's what you're getting at with real life. Isn't it interesting how we can be decades in this world without being actually real? Yeah. But don't you think something in us, I, I agree completely, we may not have any sense of who we are really, but... I think we kind of know somewhat that uh, it's not the artifice and it's not the presentation. And when somebody seems to recognize something deeper in us, we respond to that, you know, because uh, we're seen in a different way. Well, yes. And if only our parents could have done that for us when we were kids, we wouldn't have all this hassle to go through all these decades of trying to become real. But unfortunately, um, when people don't see us for real, we don't see ourselves either. Yeah. So we need a mirror. And I think um, the best work that you and I both do is when we can hold up a mirror to somebody and say, yeah. here, yeah. here's you, who is who you really are. You're not all this other stuff. Here's who you are, you know? And that's what real life is. Um, but it's just so hard to get there. Yeah, well, I, I also want to bring up your film, The Wisdom of Trauma, because in it, watching you work with people, that's what I felt you were doing and doing it so skillfully, just, um, again, not with grandiosity in any way, you know, or or nothing fancy, but uh, being so completely present and just reflecting back, oh, uh, this isn't like corrupt, this is pain. Let, Let me ask you this. Yes, it's remarkable how present I can be with people in front of a thousand people, I can be so present with one person that they open right up. I can do that. I I don't know, actually I'm not doing it. It's happening, Mm -hmm. but but I'm not doing it. Bringing that degree of realness to my personal life is a much greater challenge, which I very much suspect is your book is about. Yeah. Yeah. And what's it like for you? Like you can be this real person and a genuine shining mirror. Mm -hmm. Personally, do you find that do you bring that into your personal life? Are you able to? Is that a challenge for you? What's it like for you? Um, something is always a challenge. It's one way or another. Sometimes the other is, is more of a challenge hmm. because um, I, I like being so alone in these last three years, you know, there was also something comfortable for me Yeah. in that, you know, there's something scary also, especially yeah. in the beginning, but yeah. it was also kind of comfortable. And, uh, my initial forays into teaching, I was terrified all the time. I, I was incapable of speaking mm. uh, to people. And I was, uh, we always did team teaching and retreats. And 
uh, the first retreat I ever taught was a 30 day retreat uh, with Joseph Goldstein, one of my great colleagues. And yeah. so 30 days meant 30 evening discourses because that's how we reorganized the day. And I could not do it. I just couldn't do it. Mm. I was completely panicked and he had to give 30 talks. Wow. And, and so people it. would, he did it. Well, what do you do? You know, it was our first retreat and people were going up and yelling at him saying, why won't you let her have a voice? Why won't you let her speak? And he'd say, I'd love a night off, just like talk to her, but I could not do it. And it was really years before I I realized they weren't coming for some uh, vision of perfection. You know, they were coming uh, for some sense of connection yeah. and that I could provide just by being, you know. And, yeah. Well, that's so different for me because I remember going to a course once where the teacher says, this is especially good for people who are afraid to stand up in front of a group and say something. And I almost put my hand up to say, excuse me, but do you have something for people who are afraid not to stand up in front of a group and say something? I've always been far mm -hmm. more comfortable in front of a crowd than one to one at a party. Yeah. yeah. You know, which, which is interesting dynamic. What if we both, we're both afraid of something. I think everybody. Yeah. I mean, yeah. You know, I think it, it's, um, Somebody once said to me when I was teaching, uh, they said, um, I feel filled with loving kindness and compassion for all beings everywhere as long as I'm alone. But once I'm with yeah. others, it's really rough. And everyone in the room laughed and, and also realized it could be the other way around. Yeah. That, you know, it's fine when we're with others and it's much harder to be alone. And uh, we all have something. So I think that's why we call it fragmentation. You know, this. Well, There's some remember, movement toward wholeness. I remember the deep oceanic, infinite love I felt for my children when they were sleeping. Mm -hmm. <laughs> In the morning, over breakfast and getting them to school, that was a different story, you know. And yet, that didn't make the other one invalid. It was genuine. Yeah. And didn't you write, was it your last book with your son? My or? last book... Uh, Myth of Normal was written with my, uh, couldn't have been written without the assistance of my son, Daniel. And Daniel and I are actually working on another book together now called uh, Hello Again, A Fresh Start for Adult Children and Their Parents. And that's based very much on the our journey to, as adults, to become real with each other, to let go of the lifelong patterns that really has kept us constricted. You know, it, it, it is ultimately is all about um, release from constriction and, yeah. and, and, and moving into expansion, you know. Right? Yeah. And, often, yeah. and often when I work people, I ask them, when you have that thought or that belief or that emotion, how does your body feel? And they'll okay, say tightness, constriction, tension. And people are not quite aware of how they, when they constrict themselves psychologically, they're actually affecting their viscera and, mm -hmm. their, and their nervous system and their their um, body states. So that when we talk about expansion, the real life that you imply here, it's not just a psychological, emotional, or spiritual event. It's also very much a, a source of health-giving uh, physiological event as mm -hmm. well. You know, I tell the story in the book um, about a woman I was with who had had a child um, who'd been killed by gun violence. Oh, gosh. And she had a um, faith background such that uh, she, she was really tormented by the fact that she couldn't be at peace or she, she couldn't turn this over to God's will or something like that. And, yeah. and, uh, in the in the retreat we're holding, there was a, a psychologist who gave a very kind of scientific um, description of the vagus nerve and, and its role in trauma and things like that. And uh, you know, for me, I thought, wow, this is kind of technical, <laughs> you know, like, and this is kind of long. I wonder how it's going to go over. But at the end of it, this woman came up to me and she was radiant, mm -hmm. and she said, you know, it's not my my broken faith. It's my nervous system. 
Mm-hmm. It's actually my nervous system. And it was such a, it was a way of forgiving herself mm-hmm. for what she was feeling, which was dreadful, you know, and understanding that maybe there is a path. Well, I'll tell you um, mm-hmm. um, a relevant story, perhaps. Um, so I read an article in a Canadian newspaper yesterday about a family, one of whose members had been killed by somebody some decades ago. And the killer has not reached the time of parole. And the family is insistent that he should not be allowed out of jail. I don't blame them at all for their pain and for their sense of revenge and their wanting to keep this man. I understand it, but I think they're creating suffering for themselves unwittingly as a result. And I can tell you two stories. One is of a woman I met in Texas who started a program for troubled youth. And how she launched on that program is that her son, who was a 19-year-old young black man delivering pizzas for a living to save money to go to college, was confronted by two young black teenagers aged 14 and 15 who robbed him of his pizza and killed him. And she was filled with revengeful thoughts. And she went to the trial. And then she saw how these two had been just abused and traumatized all their lives. And she befriended them. And uh, it totally changed her life. And she expanded. She became a much happier person. Um, On the converse side of it, I have a video on my uh, computer from a black man at a Texas death row institution who, when she was, when he was 18, he killed somebody in a drug related heist. And then, and of course, all the markers of trauma in his childhood and the courts, of course, never take that into consideration. You're a monster, you're gonna die. Now, 22 years later, he's been filing one appeal, appeal after another, living in a cage on death row, seeing his friends go to their deaths regularly. And he's one of the happiest people I've met. You know what? He began to meditate. He began to deal with his trauma. He found out something about my work on trauma and addiction and began to understand his addiction. He took responsibility for what he did. He really experienced remorse. Now he's teaching kids online about how to relate to life. And he's an artist. He's having a, he can't attend it. But next week in LA, there's going to be a show of his art. Mm. And he really wants to live. And if he does live, all he can look forward to is life without parole. Mm -hmm. But he is in love with life. And he's totally relaxed and open and open hearted. And he's one of the sweetest people you'll ever meet. And he's on death row. And that's yeah. what and, and 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 meditation was a big part of his transformation. And that's what's possible for people. That's the kind of expansion. And even in the confines of a prison, yeah. That's the kind of expansion that's available for people. If only what but we knew it, you know. Yeah, it's you, true. It's- I, I say all this and I don't meditate. So. <laughs> well, you meditate in your own way, I would say. You know, uh, it's true. You and I have talked about this before. I just have mm-hmm. this resistance to spending a second alone with my own mind. You need a community. I'll be, I'll be your community. We can meditate together, even well, though far apart. You know, maybe this time I'll take you up on it. Yeah, yeah. Because it's something, I mean, obviously meditation is not the only way to do it, but there's something about, I think, relating differently to that pain. First of all, acknowledging it, which takes a lot because we're taught all our lives. But you know what happens for me? I don't feel pain. If only I felt pain. If only I felt misery and desperation, I'd love it. I just feel ennui, endless boredom, which I know is a cover. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But But I've never in meditation got to any uncomfortable place. Right, but one would assume he did, you know, that person yeah, with all the, the grief and the remorse and the and he the did. guilt and, you know, and all of that. And and sort of somehow being able to hold that and not, yeah. just, you know, fall into the stigmatization. And and uh, it's such a fine line. Like in, um, in Buddhist psychology, they say it differently than I think in Western psychology. In Buddhist psychology, 
they talk about the difference between remorse and guilt. Mm-hmm. Remorse being that very deep pain one might feel over recollecting yeah. what we've done or not done or something. Whereas guilt is more a lacerating self-hatred where we just go over and over and over and over. Oh, yeah. Guilt is about the actual self rather than what I've done. You know, and, and yeah, yeah. it's very interesting when I talk to people about guilt. Let's say this happened recently. Um, I was giving a webinar. No, I was giving a public talk. And um man stood up and said, how do, I, how do I not feel guilt about the mm-hmm. way I passed my trauma onto my kids? Which, incidentally, we all do until we figure it out. And I asked him, when in your life have you not felt guilty? And he said, never. In other words, the guilt predated anything he ever did. And the guilt actually began, when you analyze it, because his parents were not happy, and he thought that was his fault when he was two years old. You know, so at that point, you decide, I'm just not worthy. And then you do anything wrong, that feeds that sense of unworthiness, but what you did wrong didn't cause the unworthiness. The unworthiness came first. Otherwise, it would just be healthy remorse. I promised Sharon I would show up at 2 p.m. Pacific time for this conversation, and instead, uh, you know, I went watch television instead, and I, I, you know, I should have some remorse about that. But I shouldn't conclude that therefore I'm unworthy as a human being. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, definitely. It's like the uh, I was last in a room with people teaching a long time ago. Uh, and one of the places was California in March, early March of, or maybe late February of uh, 2020. And someone in the room said, um, the brain filled with shame cannot learn. Yeah. You know, and we're taught and maybe believe very thoroughly. It's a wholesome state. It's important. It's yeah. it's like having a conscience, but really it's devastating. When you talk, you talked before about the vagus nerve and, and, um, Actually, what happens is that in a state of shame, we go into a state of total neurological shutdown. And that's not a state that the brain can learn in. For the brain to learn, it has to be in what Stephen Porges, psychologist, calls the uh, social engagement mode, which is a different, which emanates from a totally different set of nerve nuclei in the brainstem and, and evokes a totally different set of circuits in the prefrontal cortex in the shame state it's like this there's a real shutdown there's a real literally wanting to sink into the earth of not wanting to be there it's essentially a dissociative state no there's no learning in that which only if the average teacher even got half an hour of lecture on that education would be so much more enlightened but instead the schools so often shame kids then they expect them to learn. Uh, you know what, John, Le- John Lennon in his song, Working Class Hero, he says they beat you and curse you for 20 odd years, then they expect you to pick a career. That was his line. Mm. There's also a quality of shame that is kind of extraordinary since you, you know, are interested in writing about toxic culture. Um, that, I just find astonishing often, like um, not being able to afford a particular thing because you don't have that much money. Uh, Yeah. Why is that like, you know, so devastating because the culture says it is that you are not worthy or you're not enough or, uh, and you may, maybe you had other priorities, you know, or all kinds of circumstances. Yes, because the culture says it, but that's not enough. You see, you can also very healthily resist what the culture says and say, I'm not Mm -hmm. buying into it. So the question is not only does the culture say it, which it does for its own purposes, but also where does it land? And if it lands in a person who in early childhood was not given a sense of value for themselves, just for who they are, or mm-hmm. whose value depended on how they performed or how they showed up for the people, then the cultural message lands on fertile ground mm-hmm. and, 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 and uh, fertilizes the seeds of shame. If, on the other hand, you were made to feel okay about yourself as a person, not for what you did or how you looked or 
how you please the little just good for existing, then the culture can do its thing. And, uh, and you'll say, well, you know, I don't agree with that. I'm not buying into that. You know, and actually so many people, I think is maybe you have found as well, their healing is exactly consists of letting go of these cultural expectations and really finding who they really are, expanding into mm -hmm. themselves. To go back to your book, real life, mm -hmm. they expand into themselves. Mm -hmm. I wonder if if there was a moment in time where you had a sense of um, a different glimpse of what our deepest nature might be like. Because I would ordinarily myself say, when I was in college, when I did this Asian philosophy course, and I heard about the Buddha's teaching, and suddenly there was this breathtaking sense of inclusivity and that life could be bigger, could be mm. different. But honestly, looking back, I think I, there's something in me that always knew that. Mm. I mean, I had no idea where I'd find it or how I'd live it or how to get there, but there was something in me that just always knew there was some voice that said things can be better. You just hang in there, you know, like, yeah. Uh, I'm a different personality, and uh, for me, it showed up in a different way. We, for me, it showed up in a deep sense. It didn't feel positive, but I suppose there's a positive message in it. In a deep sense that this, but I mean, by I mean, say this, looking at the world, the way it's functioning, is not right. It's not fair, it's not right, it's not just. Now, clearly, there must have been a sense in me that there could be other, it could be otherwise. Otherwise, where is this not right come That's from? That's right, yeah. But I didn't have such a positive vision or sense of what's available, so much as awareness of the mm -hmm. falsehood of what did present itself as reality. So, I've always, so for me to experience that wholeness, my wife, um, in the middle of a deep crisis in our relationship, had a direct experience just by surrounding to the pain and all of a sudden it was all energy it was all one and it was all the things you read about in the poets and the rumis and the buddhas and the rishis and the, you know spiritual adepts i've never had that kind of experience and um maybe it would take a lot more work for me to get there at the same time i know exactly what they're talking about Mm -hmm. I know that what they're saying is real. So how can I know what's real without having experienced it? That's my question. Because So maybe there's different levels of experience, and I'm just not tuned into some levels of my own experience. That's what I think is probably most likely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's absolutely implicit in everything you're speaking about, you know, that yeah. it's unjust because we sense justice somewhere. Yeah. That there's something intact, there's something whole, there's something unbroken. Otherwise, we wouldn't see the brokenness. Yeah, yeah. To have a sense of brokenness, yeah. you, have a, you have to have a sense of wholeness. Yeah. Otherwise, how would you know it's broken? Yeah. 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 This is really interesting, you know, to think about the culture. The cultural message has only got a place to land because of our own um, yeah. vulnerabilities, so to speak, or tendencies toward toward believing it, otherwise we would laugh and say, that's ridiculous. Yeah, well, um, it's kind of a self-perpetuating reality because the way that this society forces parents to raise their kids, when I say forces them to the dint of stress, economic privation, inequality, racism, um, materialism, stresses, the parents, themselves and trauma the parents can't see the kids for their pristine mm -hmm. real beings that they are then the kids then lose their connection to themselves now the cultural message lands on fertile ground which then they reenact and they have kids when they pass it on as well so that the vulnerability to constrict in defense um is imposed very early in childhood and then the culture express that exploits that vulnerability to sell its values and its products to people who in their constriction don't think there's any other way and it usually takes some bit of suffering for people to come to the point well this is not right 
You know, it's like mm-hmm. yeah, you have to be in slavery in Egypt to go back to the Exodus analogy. Mm-hmm. And you have to really suffer and realize there's such a thing as freedom. And even then, if you follow the Exodus story, how, um, as we were saying before, we, I think we began to talk that the very word Egypt, Hebrew Mitzrayim, means a narrow place. So whether or not historically the Exodus happened, I don't personally don't believe it did. But whether it did or not, the real significance is in that expansion into spaciousness. And mm-hmm. to what degree the Israelites um, resisted that even after their liberation. They kept wanting to go back to the flesh parts of Egypt, into slavery. So they wanted to go back into the constricted place. The freedom of expansion scared the hell out of them. Mm-hmm. Because it brought so much responsibility. And I, I think we're all like that. Yeah, I mean, I think we are. I was, I was about to ask you something like that or, or just comment on, um, you know, I hear from so many people like, I don't know if I want to, you know, open my heart or, or do that. It will leave me too exposed. It will leave me yeah. uh, too feeling responsible for making it all okay yeah. for other people, something like that, which... Of course, it doesn't have to happen, but but it is that well, image that we hold. Well, I would say to people, who is the I that doesn't know? You know, who is the I that has the doubts? And who is the I that's conflicted about it? Um, I mean, that kind of, I think, contemplative self-examination um, is, is pure gold. I think that's, if, if somebody says that, I think, congratulations, I think that's a wonderful place to be. You're like the uh, Hebrew children standing on the shores of the Nile, uh, afraid to cross it, you know, because you're afraid that the waters will swallow you up. So if somebody uh, has a group, say, of a retreat with you and or somebody um, in your kind of lineage and does compassionate inquiry, which maybe you could... Uh, describe a little bit more deeply for us um is the idea that you then have a training so you can do that with yourself or is this always going to be like a communal experience well um so it can take different forms so compassion inquiry itself is in its most um, um formalized manifestation is a year-long deep immersive interactive um participatory program for therapists and others working with people and it's not for the faint-hearted you know it's a year-long program we've had about by now over three thousand people in 80 countries studying it in the last three years um it also exists as a short course for people to do it themselves um that's not participatory it's much shorter and less expensive and it's for lay people or anybody who wants it but ultimately, the intention of both the therapeutic program and the short course is to help people be able to be present compassionately for themselves. Because people have such a hard time doing that. You know, they, they look at their trauma and then they'll say, well, uh, other people have it so much worse. If I came to them with my problem, I asked them, would you say to me, oh, God, or other people have it so much worse? No, they would never say that to me. Well, why are you saying it to yourself? You know, not you shouldn't say it to yourself, but really ask yourself, why are you saying it to yourself? So it's really fundamentally about being able to, and, you know, and some of it is outlined in the myth of normal. It's really about being able to bring compassion and inquiry to one's own issues and to the issues mm-hmm. of the world in general. It's not like, why are people doing this? But huh, why are people doing this? What's driving this whole thing? So when we ask the question compassionately, there's safety and the social engagement system opens up. When we ask ask it of ourselves or others in an accusatory fashion, why are you doing this? Or why am I doing this? What you get is a defensive shutdown and no answers will emerge. There we go. I mean, it's, it's like learning how to be with one's pain as pain rather than as wrong, you know, wrongness. Yeah. 
Or sin or something like that. That's right. Or grief. I, I was talking to somebody today, um, um, Megan Devine or Devine, who had written a book called It's Okay That You're Not Okay. And, and, it's, and it's about grief. And our society is so anti-grief. And yet grief is something that's wired into human beings. It's part of our neurological and uh, instinctual programming because in life there's, I mean, the, the Buddha said it. Life brings suffering, life brings loss. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the people that you love will die or move away or maybe won't want to talk to you. Or your dog will die or, or something. We have to be able to grieve it. That means being able to be with the grief not to run away from it, to be with the pain, as you say, and not to run away from it. So I mean, and, and what's interesting, of course, is that every generation has to learn this for themselves over and over and over again. Now, why is that? Because the previous generations didn't teach it to the young. So then you have to write a book called Real Life to help people be with reality. Mm -hmm. Now, when you say you have to, it's not like anybody for, put a gun to your head, but you're compelled to write it, you call to mm -hmm. write it, you call to write it, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because you see how that quality of being with, that expansive quality of being with, is missing from the world. Yeah. Here we are. It's the first time I, the first time I heard, um, uh, moral injury talked about, and somebody described it as a kind of soul wound. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, yeah, you know, there we are, you know, some burgeoning hope of what life would be, and then it's so different, or or, or we're mired in shame, or we're lost in some way. And, uh, and it's so hard, but it's a lot harder without one another. And there's mm -hmm. something about that that's really, really potent. I think what they call moral injury, at least my understanding of it, is that when you're watching some people suffer and you're helpless to intervene, or you at least you perceive yourself as helpless to intervene. So if you're a soldier and you see villagers being massacred, you know, or if you're a doctor and, or a nurse in an emergency ward, and you see suffering that the system perpetuates, but you perceive it as helpless to intervene. Yeah. Yeah. That's the moral injury, which means that there's a part of us that really demands to be engaged and to make a difference. And when that part of us is somehow hobbled, we suffer what's called moral injury. Yeah, the last thing I want to uh, ask you about, although mm -hmm. I would love to keep going, I know we need to stop, but um, is about caregivers, you know, which we've talked about in the past and people who have vicarious trauma, you know, people who with great empathy are trying to make a difference for maybe a person in their family or uh, some segment of, you know, population or really on the front lines of suffering and how hard that is. By the way, in my vocabulary, there's no such thing as vicarious <laughs> trauma. There's mm -hmm. either trauma okay. or not trauma, but no, no trauma is vicarious. And... Uh, <laughs> I, I very often find that when people think they're suffering vicarious trauma because they're seeing other people being traumatized or other, you know, and they know it's their own unresolved trauma that gets awakened. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't think there's anything vicarious about trauma. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. It's people's own woundedness that they hadn't resolved mm -hmm. yet, that they haven't healed yet, that's being, acti mm -hmm. that's being activated. Mm -hmm. That's just my universal experience. Mm -hmm. So... There's certain terms that I think I question very highly. That's one of them, vicarious trauma. The other is uh, compassion fatigue. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't think there's such a thing as compassion fatigue. You know, nobody gets fatigued from being compassionate. You get fatigued because you're not compassionate to yourself. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, so that you're always giving, 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 because you're driven to do so, and you don't care for yourself. You're going to get tired. But that's not yeah. compassion fatigue. That's lack of compassion for yourself fatigue is what it is. Yeah. So there's all these words that we use that I think sometimes require some deeper examination. Yeah, many. Well, that's why, I mean, I, uh, I mean, there's a lot of research being done on so-called compassion fatigue, knowing it's not compassion fatigue, you know. Uh, 
vicarious trauma I use just because it's the it's like the code, you know, for yeah. it's yeah. not just the person. But you're right, of course. You know, there's a tremendous history amongst many people who choose a certain profession precisely because they've been exactly. through it in some way. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And the moral injury is off is is of course fundamentally, as you say, the sense of helplessness. And it's also it's the conflict, you know, it's like I first heard about it from a hospice nurse, yeah. for example, who would say maybe the patient's ready to go, ready to let go, and the medical profession is ready to have them go, and the family cannot let them go. Yeah. And so you're in this role of yeah. uh, of tremendous conflict. Yeah. Um, I've been in that situation in palliative care. Mm -hmm. I had a patient once who we kept alive through IVs, but she was tired of it, you know? And I talked with her, and, I, and she's been one of those people her all her life. It always pleased others. I mean, these are the people who end up, by the way, in palliative care very often. That's a whole other, whole other conversation. But I, I, I was talking with her, um, and I said, what do you really want? And she said, my daughters can't stand the idea of me going. And I said, I'm not asking you what your daughters want. I'm asking what you want. And she said, okay, I want to go. I want you to take out my IVs. The daughters hated me for years afterwards because I followed the mother because she died mm -hmm. two days mm -hmm. earlier. She died two days earlier mm -hmm. than she might have otherwise because I removed the IV because she wanted me to, you know? Yeah. And there was a very interesting dynamic. Well, I'm feeling it. Um, well, I want to thank you for your tremendous work and it's making a difference. I can see that mm -hmm. in the world and, and may it ripple out, you know? And, Thank uh, you. Thank you. And uh, thank you for yours because uh, although it's true that I don't meditate with any regularity, I do have your book, Real Happiness, on my shelf here. And uh, it's an inspiration because <laughs> I know what's in it because I've read it. You yeah, know? yeah. Uh, it's making a difference for me. And as much as I sort of jovially dismiss my meditative capacities, Without my awareness of meditation and contemplation, right. I would not be where I am in terms of yeah, the work the yeah. work that I do. I, I wouldn't be. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we'll have to arrange a date to to sit together sometime. Well, let's do that sometime. We'll do it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Um, it's been really, it was very gracious of you and kind of you to to do this. And uh, If you say so, to me it's just a pleasure, but thank you. Yeah, well, I enjoyed it. It's great. It's always great to be with you. So thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, folks. Thanks for listening. If you'd like to learn more about Sharon's work, her virtual offerings, classes, courses, really all things Sharon, you can visit her website at SharonSalzberg.com. This has been the Meta Hour podcast from the Be Here Now Network. May you be safe, may you be happy, may you be healthy, and may you live with ease. <laughs>